fantasy-esque and welcome back to the Werewolf Amazon Challenge in The Sims 4. In the last chapter, Prince Charlie aged up into a child and moved into the royal grounds. He developed the mean trait and wasted no time in becoming enemies with Lord Roy as soon as he joined the castle. Charlie engaged in an archery contest with Master Eugene and Master Edwin later on, at the end of which he earned the title of 4th Prince and a 5th place in ranking. He won against Eugene, but later lost against Edwin, making him the only prince to rank below a noble. It is the night of the full moon once again upon us, and our werewolves have, well, transformed into werewolves. And I wanted to take a look at uh, Master Eugene in his werewolf form because this is the first time that he is transforming. He is this really cool grey and blonde wolf, almost like, yeah, light, like is you know, just a dusting of gold on him. But he's a grey and blonde wolf. Looks really cool, and I have to say, he looks quite imposing in his werewolf form, no? I feel like um, Harvey is quite lean in appearance. Yeah, look, Harvey's quite lean in his werewolf form. Uh, what about Prince Elma? Prince Elma and I think... I mean, he looks pretty well built. He looks- oh look, there's a werewolf ghost. Whose ghost is this? Whose ghost are you socializing with? Oh, I don't know where the ghost went. I don't know. But apparently guys, I noticed this. The ghosts will also transform into their werewolf forms during the full moon and then they turn back. Just when our normal sims do. Which is so so cool. But um, yeah, I think Elma, he's quite well built. For some reason though, um, Eugene seems quite imposing to me but he looks really cool he looks really cool wait that wasn't eugene this is eugene yeah eugene looks imposing to me just a little bit and i'm not sure why but his face his wolf face looks so cool i think he actually has one of the most attractive wolf faces among our werewolves but okay i really just wanted to take a look at that obviously we have some interactions that we cannot do because our sims are, you know, too busy being wolves. But actually, what I might do, what I might do is still go through my notes for the whims that they did have, and then I'll try and complete them off camera when these guys transform back. So let's take a look, shall we? Now, some of you have also been saying in the previous episode that watching the series really makes you want to give werewolves another chance and you're liking the horse ranch pack as well and you know it makes me so happy when people watch either the vampire series or you know they watch the werewolf series and they think of new ways to play with certain occults or they find a fun way to do something that they haven't tried before and it changes their perspective on the game a bit that makes me so so happy because it actually feels like we are doing something fun with everyone um, and you know, I like to think I'm filling a void for certain people, especially myself. I've mentioned this before, but there are certain types of gameplays that I, I look for on YouTube and I don't find it. People aren't doing it. It makes me sad, so then I have to come and play my game and, you know, try and put that type of content out there. Basically, I'm playing what I want to see other people play and I can't find it, which is why I'm playing it. <laughs> ah, okay, so let's have a look at some of the notes. Now, there's some sims right now that are just going above and beyond to provide me with storyline and that makes me so happy. Right now, one of my favorite characters, our golden wolf, Prince Harvey, is doing such a thing. He is going above and beyond to provide me with storyline. So let's take a look at what Harvey is up to. So Harvey, guys, wants to be mean to Lady Ada. I wonder, can they be mean in their werewolf forms? Like, does that count? I don't actually know. He can snarl at. We're gonna try snarling at him. We'll say that that's part of uh, what he wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll do that. I think we'll do that. So he's running over to her. He's gonna snarl at Ada. I think a lot of the interactions they have in their wolf form is quite aggressive. 
Okay, there we go. Yep. Oh, that fulfilled. So they can do certain interactions. Nice. Like mean interactions. Anyways, he wants to be mean to Ada and put her in her place. He overheard her talking with Eugene about Elmer being Eugene's best friend and is incensed she would influence Eugene to break away from him. So he seems to have some sort of misunderstanding about Ada trying to, you know, be a barrier between Eugene and Harvey and she's instead encouraging um, Eugene, her son, and Elmer to be really close friends and in the last chapter at the end we kind of saw that Harvey, you know, to him Eugene is his best friend but Eugene doesn't feel the same way. In Eugene's eyes, uh, he and so Eugene and Elma, they are mutually best friends. Harvey obviously doesn't know this just because he's really fond of Eugene, he assumes Eugene uh, is fond of him too and they have this understanding with each other and who is dancing this is this is Earl isn't it is this Earl <laughs> Earl you are grinding up against who is this and it's very inappropriate sir against Michael yeah I think I think this is Earl I think Earl is grinding up against um, hmm, against Michael and that was inappropriate could that have been Claude could that have been Claude no, that, that, I was right. That was totally ill. <laughs> oh, you need to calm down, okay? You need to calm down. You are grinding up against um, Harvey's father, like l literally in front of him. Okay, let's get past that uncomfortable truth. But um, yeah, Harvey has some sort of misconception. Um, I think Ada was just encouraging the friendship between Elma and Eugene because she saw that they make a really good kind of support group for each other. So she, she didn't know, she doesn't know that Harvey, you know, is possessive over her son. But Harvey here, he kind of overheard that bit of encouragement and now he's really cheesed off and he thinks Ada is trying to sabotage him. So he, for that reason, wanted to put her in her place. So that was one thing. Um, the next thing, Harvey also wants to be friendly with Lady Helen. I don't know if we can do anything with Helen right now in the werewolf form. I don't think so. The only thing they'll do is snarl at each other, so I'll fulfill that later. But essentially, Harvey also wants to be friendly with Helen and get into her good books in case Ada says something about him. He has been observing the two and he knows Helen has a strange protective relationship with his stepmother because Ada is his stepmother and Eugene is actually his stepbrother. So that is something that uh, we have so many relationships at this point, we kind of forget certain things. And yes, it is almost Prince Elmer's birthday. He's gonna age up on Sunday, I am aware, I am aware. So he obviously, I mean, it's public knowledge that um, Helen is Ada's mistress. It's public knowledge, right? But he wants to try and keep a, at this point, low profile. You know, I was wondering guys why for so long Harvey has been such a calm, evil kid when his younger brother Charlie is mean but he rocks up at the palace and starts making enemies. I was wondering like why is that a thing and then I thought back to when I used to do the vampire series and I remembered that usually I attribute evil sims as being like vicious and intelligent or I think I attribute them as being cal calculative uh, and manipulative which is different to mean sims who are a little bit more blunt and a little bit more straightforward and a little bit more petty. So I think that's the way I differentiate the two traits. So evil sims think long and hard about certain things, they have masks, um, you know, personality masks, they don't show their true selves to people very often, they like to manipulate in the background, they calculate a lot, whereas mean sims, they just go for it and people typically know that they have a bad attitude. But with evil sims, you might think they're the nicest, you know, purest person in the world, but actually they'll be stabbing you in the back. So from that perspective, it does make sense the way Harvey acts. So there we go. There is that. There is that. Now, oh, 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 we can actually, uh, yes, we should be able to be friendly with Helen now. Oh, I don't know, she's pixelated, but we can, we can, um, be friend with be friends with her we can be nice to her so you know this is a trait of evil sims being two-faced essentially 
He's being totally two-faced right now. But he's gonna go ahead. He is going to be friendly with Helen. I'm pretty sure all the boys... Oh, they didn't finish their homework, that's right. They were in the middle of doing homework when suddenly everyone started changing. It's okay, I'll get them... Oh, it's Friday, they're gonna go to school soon. You know what, I don't think I'll be able to get it done in time, so I'm, I'm not gonna bother too much. Kinda leave it be. Also, where the heck is Helen, and how the heck did she get there? I am a little bit... Where'd she go? I'm confused. How did she end up all the way here? Are you telling me that Helen, in her werewolf form, ran all the way down here? I mean, this place is beautiful, though. Look at this. This is so, so pretty. This is so pretty. I mean, we rarely take a walk around the world, but the world is actually quite lovely. Look at that, Master Eugene Blades has made it through the full moon. What a harrowing experience. Hopefully he learns a thing or two about a werewolf. You know the cool thing um, is kind of recalling the moments at which our teens so far have become werewolves or, you know, gone through their first transformation. So with Elmer, he went through his first transformation, I'm pretty sure out here, and Harvey was watching, the youngsters were watching, but he had it out here in the open with some of the older werewolves. With Harvey, it was different. He ran to go hide in the bathroom, like this one here, uh, because he thought he wasn't going to transform, and then he transformed, but it, he was like on his own. And then with Eugene, he was actually down in the butler's room with the others doing their homework. So he was actually here with um, Elma and Harvey doing their homework or getting started with their homework. And then they all started transforming together. So, you know, he transformed in, in a little pack. So that's kind of interesting to me, the way that these Sims have transformed. And the cool thing about that is I didn't necessarily plan it. It kind of just happened autonomously. Obviously we have certain storylines going and certain things we want to see with our werewolves, but at the end, oh my goodness, what happened to her hands? At the end of the day, I don't always go ahead and do stuff with them. Uh, most of the time, I just let them run autonomously on free will and see what they will do, which is really, really cool and fun. It definitely takes a lot of the stress of, you know, planning certain things. Um, and gives flexibility and we have so many cool plots just trying to figure out like what the heck they're doing and why they're doing it and that's part of the fun for me trying to write stories out of like in my mind out of their actions okay so we got that done so Ada let's come here so Ada okay she looks like she's in jail let's go find Earl where is Earl Okay, Earl. She wants to flirt with Lord Earl. So she's actually going to come here and do that. She's going to flirt with him. Um, let's leave Stone. We're going to run up to Earl. And I think the boys are all heading off to Academy right now. Which is great. You guys go off, do your own little thing. Ada is calmly and collectedly going to go up to Earl. Okay, please tell me you stopped on the next floor and not anywhere higher. Is he here? Is he here? Yes, he is. Okay. So, Ada wants to flirt with Earl and learn more about the early days of his arrival. She remembers that Elmo was close to everyone as a child, but after Earl's arrival, he became a little distanced for a period of time before returning to his normal self. She's worried about him because she sees him as the best candidate for Alpha in the next generation, especially after the attitude that Harvey has had with her, and then she has been hearing from uh, Roy and some of the males that Charlie has declared himself as Roy's enemy and you know he's the first prince at such a young age to declare an enemy and a lot of these older sims, older werewolves, they kind of know what being an enemy means once you're an alpha because once you've become enemies with someone uh, you will declare them to be executed or you will um, announce the execution. So I think in their mind, they're thinking that 
Charlie would be a very dangerous alpha to have because it seems like he can very easily turn you into an enemy and execute you. And that's not what they want for their future alpha. Obviously, they're thinking about their kids too. Like, what if one day my son um, ends up on the wrong side of Charlie's, you know, um, emotions and then he's going to end up dead. So they obviously don't want that. That is something they're thinking about. Um, Ed, he is actually quite good friends with everyone, but Elma is well and truly exceptional in the way he acts and behaves. So she's, you know, definitely been more focused on Elma of late. And then while thinking of, you know, how Elma has always been so great, even as a kid, she started thinking about him when he was a kid. And then she realized, you know, Elma, she's always been super like friendly and nice to people but there was a period of time that no one can explain where he suddenly kind of drew into himself and became really quiet and was keeping a distance and it took him some time before he got comfortable with everyone again and he started uh, you know returning back to his normal self and she remembers it was around that time when Earl kind of started participating in the matches when Lily brought him in and then he joined the pack or you know I think it was Ada that asked Lily to invite her brother to join the matches so she remembers it was around that time and she's wondering if Earl knows something if you know he noticed anything on his part or if maybe something happened between him and Elma which is why Elma suddenly had a change in attitude obviously Obviously, Earl isn't going to say nothing because that would throw him on the deep end because he kind of did something he wasn't supposed to. So I don't think he would want to lay out his secrets and be like, oh, you know, um, I just accidentally threw your beloved prince into another dimension and the prince that you guys actually love right now is not that prince. This is, this is a different prince to the one that, you know, Julia birthed in this dimension. And I don't think he wants to go into all of that. Uh, and then, who knows, that might be a can of worms for other things he's been hiding from them and other things he has done, potentially things his sister has done, or even the fact that he may, may have had an inkling that his sister was planning to overthrow the Alpha. I mean, it was never discussed outright, but Earl and his sister, they had an interesting philosophical way of talking about things, and sometimes, sometimes, they could really draw conclusions about their intentions, but they wouldn't want to overstep their boundaries and actually call them out on it. So, you know, his sister did end up dead. Um, she was poisoned, unfortunately, by Elma, I'm pretty sure. So, yeah, there's just, there's, there's a lot of things that um, they don't want to discuss, but Ada noticed something. Um, and Elle has brushed it off, so hopefully she puts it to rest and she doesn't investigate any further. Um, but really, Elma, Elma and Earl are the only ones who really know about it. So unless one of them cracks, I don't think anyone's going to be able to figure out what exactly happened. Because, I mean, who's going to try, who's going to think and theorize out of nowhere that someone just, you know, ripped open a, a place in the, the, um fabric of reality and kind of threw, threw a sim into another dimension and pulled a sim from another dimension. I don't think anyone's going to think that far ahead, you know? Magic, yes. Magic, their thoughts may go to magic, but I don't think anyone's thinking of things that are that magical. It's a bit, it's a bit crazy. Okay, so I'm going to leave these guys be. I'll wait for the kids to come back. We'll see if we take them out somewhere. Definitely want to get the homework done. It is so much hassle to do everyone's homework now that we have like six kids. Thank goodness we didn't have more, guys. Thank goodness we didn't have more. We are picking up on Saturday morning. Some of our youngsters still have not um, gone to the writing skills, so I want them to take Twilight out for a ride. Right now, Charlie is getting his chance. I think, I think Ed actually hasn't, like, taken the horse out for, actually no, he has apparently. Apparently he's got a little bit of riding skill, but that's barely anything. Okay, so Charlie's the only one who hasn't gone riding, so this will be his chance. We're gonna go for a relaxed ride. Um, not something, you know, too crazily energetic. Look at how dignified he looks. 
Look at him! He's just staring down. He looks like he's better than everything and everyone. <laughs> I love him so much. He's got so much attitude. He's got a very princely um, demeanor, I feel, on that horse. Just his downcast eyes. I just love it. Okay, so, th so that is that. And then, guys, we are going to jump over to the one note that I have from the one sim that is consistently giving us a great story. My favorite, Prince Harvey. So we're going to jump over to him. Harvey, guys, wants to be mean to Queen Julia, the flippin' alpha. I mean, this can easily spiral into a death sentence, but hey, he's willing to risk it. So he's going to go and be mean to his mother uh, demand independence okay he is gonna demand independence so he was talking to Ed and then Julia came he's gonna demand his independence so he wants to be mean to Julia because everyone is talking about how she thinks Elma is alpha material and he feels that it's unfair because Julia has four sons. In his opinion, they should all have a fair chance to prove themselves and they won't be able to do that until the succession. So he wants his mother to keep her opinion to herself if she's not going to be um, fair to all the sons. Like if she's going to be biased towards someone, he wants her to keep that opinion to herself because she's the alpha, she's going to sway other people and that's it's kind of like he tries to keep himself under control but there are certain times when his anger and his frustration kind of just breaks through the surface and this is one of those times i think it's been building up because he's had all this insecurity about himself his position his strength and then suddenly he starts hearing and you know we've gotten that notification a few times where he's feeling judged by others especially when he talks to the kennel master helen and is talking about training he's feeling judged um and then you know on top of that now he's hearing that their mother is going around saying that elma might be the next alpha that he's alpha material so he he did not like that one bit and he wanted to basically uh, share his side of the story which is please please stop saying crap like that because it is unfair and I will not stand for it so yeah that was him that was Harvey being Harvey now why is Julia just out of curiosity okay her rage is going up quite a bit interestingly enough I swear no one in the pack I think has managed to get transformation mastery like the only ones who have managed to are the males who keep walking around in their werewolf form i'm pretty sure they're the only ones who have managed to get transformation mastery okay maybe not maybe not our boy here which one's this this is roy okay maybe not roy because he's glowing red but you know the other werewolves they have attained mastery which is why they're walking around in their transformed forms but uh I'm surprised our our horses have not or our horses no our, our werewolves I mean werewolves they have not okay how is Charlie doing I love seeing our little our little wolves in their in their armor they look so cute so guys I have finally finally come to a decision about the whole armor color thing I'm gonna do so basically starting from when um, Elma becomes a young adult, I'm going to start changing the armors of everyone in his generation and on. So the males, I haven't decided which colors, but the males are going to have one color of armor regardless of whether they're in the pack, outside the pack, in the castle, outside the castle. Um, they're going to have one color of armor and the females are going to have another color of armor. So we're only going to be working with two colors just to make things easier. I think that's what we're we're gonna do so we'll kind of have like this concept of you know the the sons of soul and the daughters of loon um, with their different armor colors so yeah there we go that's kind of the concept and we talked about this way back in chapter one um, the whole reason in our werewolf society why they switch between male heirs and female heirs is because they believe in balancing feminine and masculine energies and you know for the for the betterment of the the empire 
or the, you know the kingdom and having balance in the kingdom being balanced with nature uh, they feel like there should be an equal representation of soul and loon so the sons of soul and the daughters of loon so i yeah we have we have that to look forward to and obviously we're gonna have elma's birthday on sunday so what i might do what i might do uh, I mean, actually, it's Saturday after we, you know, get some writing done. We could just go back to the castle and hang out there for a little bit before having Elma's birthday. I'll, I'll see how I feel and what everyone's up to, and then we can get moving from there. We are continuing on Saturday morning, and guys, I'm really, really loving how the plot is just bouncing between two of our princes right now. So I have some notes here that we are going to go through. Ada wants to chat with Earl, so I need to find Lord Earl. Do we even have the... Oh, we haven't started the gatherings. That's fine. We're going to call Earl over. And then we are going to grab him and we are going to chat with him. So Ada, Ada, it seems as though she's just not letting go. She is just not letting go of this matter to do with Prince Elma. Uh, I could just teleport him over and I might get impatient enough to do that. So heckin, let's just go and teleport him over because uh, we require him for story purposes. Thank you very much. So I am gonna grab him. Let's see. Oh, he's already here, probably. Uh, yes, Earl. Oh. Okay. So, let's go ahead and, well, chat with him. We'll try to calm him down for one. I don't know why he's, he's angry, if that is the case. But Ada wants to chat with Earl about some things she read. Ada, you see, was cleaning up old books in the castle library, and she found a collection of diaries from when Elma was young. He seemed to have a lot of plans for the future, but then the writings stopped. There's only one entry made months after, which look and sound different, and it mentions Earl. So, this is the diary entry. He has abilities unlike anything I've encountered before. Lord Earl Eternal. And that's it. So, she saw this, like, two-sentence entry, and it has Lord, like, Earl Eternal's name, and the sentence doesn't even sound like something that um, Elma had been writing about beforehand. So now she's wondering, like, what abilities? What has he encountered? What is he talking about? Earl never mentioned that he and Elma had any sort of friendship, so why why has Elma mentioned Earl? Earl was new at the time, there's no way Elma would have known him beforehand. So she is very, very curious. And they don't seem like they're that close. You know, what happened that I don't know about? So Elma's relationship with Earl, I mean, they're friends. We know why they're friends. He was relying on Earl quite a bit when he was younger and he felt safe with Earl um, until he felt comfortable enough to go out of that, you know, safety zone and start being normal with others again and fostering relationships with others again. So since then... His, you know, relationship with Earl has gone down. And look at Harvey being so fake. But yeah, his relationship with Earl has gone down. So Ada's confused. She's thinking it's not like they hit it off when, you know, he was young and Earl was new. And that they have this really close friendship where they would share secrets. So for someone who seemingly doesn't have much connection with each other, what is this diary entry? And so she's been paying attention to the kids when they do their homework now. And she is noticing that, you know, the writing, the handwriting, early on in Elma's diary entries, they look different to the last diary entry that he had, and even to um, Elma's homework right now. Like, the homework right now matches the last diary entry, but the writing doesn't match the early entries. So she, she can't make heads or tails of what's going on, but now she's... She's kind of honed in on this, and she wants to know what's going on. She wants to figure it out. And nobody's helping her learn the truth of the matter. Nobody's being straightforward with her. But she can tell that it seems to be a sensitive topic, because Earl seems very guarded when it comes to it. 
So there we go. Well, that's it. She was ready to kind of put an end to the discussion after Earl said, no, there's nothing going on. Like, I don't remember anything from when I came. Nothing really happened. Um, and she was ready to put it to rest. But then she saw these entries and she saw his name mentioned in it. And she thought, okay, is there a reason why they clearly do have something going on? And he said, no, there isn't. So that's kind of piqued her curiosity. And then Queen Julia wanted to chat with Lady Ada. So she's going to go down and she's going to try and not spread beastly rumors. She's going to talk about sunny weather. Yeah, she's going to go and do that. So can we, can we go down? Or do I have to? Okay, I gotta do this. I gotta go do this. That's fine. You come down here. Or you could just brag about your baby. Yeah, go do that. Brag about your children. Um, maybe maybe take a break from bragging about Elma because that kind of got you in trouble from Harvey. Anyways, Julia, guys. Julia. She wants to chat with Lady Ada because she's been noticing that her wife seems quite preoccupied lately. She's willing to hear Ada out if there's anything to be concerned about and help, but Ada's gonna tell her that nothing's wrong and that she's just found a new passion. Of course, this new secret passion of hers is trying to figure out what happened to Elma in the past in his childhood. Um, because I think she's worried um, I, I think initially she was worried that he has some sort of, like, secret trauma that is gonna affect him becoming alpha in the future, or if it's gonna debilitate him as they get closer to succession, and she wanted to, you know, help deal with that before he gets to the succession, but then along the way she's kind of finding things out that seem a bit odd and don't match up, and, you know, is they're, they're a bit strange. So I think she is starting to like deviate a bit from her original intention because now there's certain secrets and she's trying to figure out, maybe still with you know a slight intention of, I hope that it's nothing that's gonna affect him negatively, but at the same time, obviously something happened so I can't just let it rest and here she goes getting slapped again. That seems to be their relationship right now, just you know, romancing Julia and getting slapped by Helen. Anyways, anyways, I think uh, I should start preparing a cake and stuff for Elma's birthday into a young adult, which I'm so excited for. And, oh, look, he's, he's gonna go yell at Harvey. Yes, all these two do is fight each other. And funnily enough, a lot of the times when I see the interactions, it's actually been Elma who is, like, fighting and being being mean with Harvey and I'm wondering why that is like why is it but well, I'm not doing it it's not whims he doesn't have these whims but more often than not when they have a disagreement uh, Harvey I don't know maybe Harvey says something to provoke him but a lot of the times I notice Elma giving out more interactions um, of this kind of capacity aye, aye, aye. It is Saturday evening and we have brought the pack out to the woods so that we can hang out with each other, you know, some fresh air, get some fresh air, and when it gets closer to midnight we'll have the birthday for Elma into a young adulthood, which I'm very excited for because I think we're going to be giving him facial hair and... I think from now on, I'm going to show you guys the makeovers in Cass because I feel like we'll be able to see it better and, you know, Cass has better lighting um, and uh, they're not <clears throat> walking around everywhere and I don't have to freeze them. So I think that's what I'll probably end up doing from now on. But um, Helen over here, guys, has decided to start off things on a super duper dramatic note because Helen wants to become enemies with Lord Ralph, her fated mate. <sighs> Anyways, guys, where is Ralph? Where is Ralph? I feel terrible for him. I feel terrible. I didn't realize their relationship had gotten that bad, but a bunch of us were saying how sad it is that, you know, they're the only living fated mates now, but 
despite us wanting them to have a happy ending, Ada had to screw things up and start pursuing Helen, and then Helen changed her mind and she started being attached to Ada, became Ada's mistress, and then things between Helen and Ralph really started going bad, and they've never recovered since, but we need to find him. She's determined, she has decided that she is going to <clears throat> declare him as her enemy and oh this makes me even more sad because Edwin is close to his father, he's actually really close to his father and is hugging him and spending time with him and this is definitely going to form part of the reason why Helen just is not, is not happy with Ralph. I hate this so much. You know guys, recently, I've been disliking Helen. I've been disliking Helen. I, like, it's, it's a combination of the way she treats Ralph, her expectations of her son. Anyways, she, there we go, has declared Ralph her enemy. Okay, so, she wants to do this because as much as she feels connected to him, she feels disgusted with his military lineage. Every time they touch each other and are in close proximity, she can't stand the fact that his kind destroyed hers. Even now, when she looks at their son, she hates how much he seems like Ralph. She wants to make it clear to Edwin that his father is not someone to emulate. So, we've talked about this before, we know that she has- <gasps> Bunny! That bunny's so cute. But we know that she has expectations from Edwin. Um, normally, a werewolf parent would feel very proud of the fact that, you know, their son ranks above a prince and therefore above all the lords here. Edwin has a higher status than his own father because he won in the archery contest against Charlie and he ranks above Charlie. And Charlie technically ranks above the, like, the, the lords. So... A normal werewolf parent would be immensely proud of what he's done, and Ralph is proud of Edwin, and he tells Edwin that. But the more he succeeds as a werewolf, in the werewolf side of things, um, because, you know, the, the whole status thing, the whole, you know, trying to get your strength up, fighting with others, that is very much a werewolf custom. Those are werewolf customs that Helen's ancestors didn't have, they had to adopt those to fit in with werewolf society. So every time Edwin succeeds in this side of life, it makes her feel more and more like Edwin's becoming the monster that destroyed her ancestors and, you know, her, her family's bloodline and their people. I mean, they survived, but their people were massacred. That's how the kingdom was destroyed. So she is just not happy with this, and she has decided that she's gonna clearly and publicly make Ralph her enemy so that Edwin understands where his mother is um, in terms of her relationship with his father and that her mother really doesn't see anything in Ralph that is worth him, uh, you know, copying, emulating, looking up to. So, ah, uh, this crushes me, this guts me, I'm so sad, they were my favorite favorite werewolf couple, in my opinion, the most attractive couple, but this is what it has come to. Then again, guys, what can we expect from a jealous sim? There is no happiness here. You know, a part of me feels so, so sad. We had really fun and really happy memories here when we came here the first few times. I remember there was a time, I'm pretty sure Julia actually had her birthday from a young adult into an adult here. So, you know, we've we've had good times in the past, but the way things are now with the people of Julia's generation is just very different to what it used to be in the beginning, and it makes me so, so, so immensely sad. You know, I really hope that in the next generation, we have happier faded mates and happier couples. I think that would really warm my my heart if, if we had just happier endings next time around. I'm just, I wasn't expecting us to have like no happy endings this time around, especially when all the faded mates started popping off in the beginning. I was like, oh yeah, we're totally gonna have a dozen faded mates and you know, happy faded mates, but no, everyone has had a miserable ending. Everyone has had a miserable ending. And looks like Eugene 
<clears throat> and Claude have become good friends. Yes. Oh, you like comedy? You like comedy? Who are you being comedic with? With Alma? Okay. Because, you know, you don't necessarily like people. But that was the only note that I had for um, this time around. And it was, it was dramatic. It was Helen. It was out of nowhere. I was very surprised. I was very surprised. Um, we are getting closer to the time when we have the birthday. Oh, look at Edwin. He was being so nice and he was actually spending time with the little horse with stone. You know what guys, uh, in the beginning as well, I used to get very confused between the names of the lords and even the kids, but the more we are playing with them and the more we are doing these notes, I feel like I'm really getting familiar with each of the characters, like, you know, the lords, like, who is whose father, who is whose mother, I remember I used to get so confused in the beginning, uh, even the way some of the werewolf forms look, I'm starting to recognize them now, um, so that's really cool, I love that, I love it when you fall into this this familiarity with the sims you're playing with, especially when we have like this many sims because we actually have quite a few sims. Uh, we have quite a cast of characters. So um, I'm yeah, really happy with that. But I want to know actually <clears throat> who we can send out riding. Um, let's see, we've got a three, a five, a two, a three, we have a two, 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 one with Edwin. Okay, so we're gonna send Edwin riding, because Edwin has not been riding. And I'm actually not gonna change him into his armor, because everyone's dressed in their formal wear for the birthday party or the birthday event we're gonna have. So I kinda wanna leave him in his formal attire, but I am gonna get him to just, you know, go on a nice ride. I mean, he, he can celebrate the birthday from a distance while he's riding Twilight. They don't have to, you know, be here necessarily for the whole thing. And to be honest, I feel like Edwin, after he saw his parents um, have that major argument where, you know, they declared or where his mother declared his father her enemy and that was straight after Edwin and Ralph were having like a really sweet father son moment, I think he would want to go off and just cool down a little bit. I think it's it's a little bit unexpected and stressful and upsetting for him to be here right now. So he's gonna he's gonna want to go off um, away from all of this, away from the 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 fighting and the drama and the expectations that his mother has. And he's you know I feel like he's an intelligent kid. Because he actually is, I think, the one Sim that breezes through his homework all the time. All the time, and he's not even a genius. So I feel like he has enough sense to know the point his mother's trying to make. And, you know, he doesn't really like it, but then again, he's not carrying his father's name. He is carrying his mother's name. So he can't really avoid those expectations. Ah, oh, Edwin. I feel like this this whole segment here has really endeared him to me. So, that was nice. Okay, while he goes off, everyone else, they are finally going to have Elma's birthday celebration. So let's come here. Let's blow out the candles, Elma. You are going to be aging up into a young adult. You're going to be getting your final trait. And then you're going to be having your makeover. I'm really excited for him. I'm really excited. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Okay, Elma. Happy birthday, my boy. Happy birthday. There we go. His aging up. And flippin' hell, Jesse. Get out of the way. He's so handsome, though. Just ignore his... Ignore his neck being cut up because of the outfit. It is unfortunately something we just have to deal with, but Oh, Elma! Elma cutie pie. Okay, I definitely have to give you makeover. Obviously the transformation from teen to young adult isn't that different So he will be probably more different once I give him the makeover, but I will see you guys in Cast. I will have to jump into a different household if I don't want, you know, to delete more sims and throw them into different dimensions. So I'll definitely do that, but we are gonna check up on Elma and see how he looks. 
I have finished the makeover for Prince Elma as a young adult. This is how he looks. We're gonna take a closer look at his face and we are gonna go through his outfits really quickly before I talk about the trait that he randomized, which was lazy. So he has a lot of uh, reds and blues as a young adult. So if we take a look at his face, there we go, he's growing out his hair a little bit, he has a little bit of facial hair, definitely makes him look um, different to what he did as a youngster, but I like, I like the changes. So we have his everyday outfit over here, then we have his formal outfit, which he is probably gonna get changed into for the continuation of his, you know, birthday party slash event, or we might bring them back into the castle, I haven't decided yet. Um, we have his armor as a young adult, so like I said, from now on I'll be doing just two colors, one for males, one for females, and I've decided that the Sons of Sol are going to have white armor, so all the males from Elma's generation, like once they hit young adulthood and any new characters that get added in, um, they are going to have the white armor. So there we go. This is his sleepwear, his party wear, uh, swimwear. Uh, hot weather, I always keep the same as every day. And then his cold weather outfit. Now let's really quickly talk about... Did we take... We did take a close-up of his face, right? I'm pretty sure we did, because that is the most exciting part. Um, so he randomized the lazy trait, which I was very surprised by. And... I forgot that he even had the paranoid trait, but like a quick recap on him growing up. So the vegetarian trait, I'm pretty sure he had as a child, and that was Elma feeling more connected with his civilized self and feeling as though werewolves don't have to keep giving in to their feral side and you know he was going to make all these changes when he got older, or well at least the original Elma did, but you know that is something even Elma in the other dimension um, was feeling. And when he became a teen, he got the paranoid trait because I'm pretty sure just before he became a teen, we had a ton of deaths. Um, he actually saw his uh, brother, El not Elma, Alfred, his older brother Alfred get poisoned and die from that. And then Elma himself had to poison Lily, the person who poisoned his brother, because he knew Lily was up to no good. And he's actually the only one who knows that Lily was planning to overthrow his mother, the Alpha. So he became paranoid that people around him would die or get killed and I think that's part of the reason why he's so attentive to everyone and is so caring towards everyone. He doesn't want to miss um, miss anything ever again. Like he, he, I think a part of him feels guilty that he picked up on some of the signs but he, he missed the fact that Lily was going to um, poison Alfred and that's something he's always going to carry with him so I think it's a part of, you know, repentance as well. He's trying to do his his best for everyone that remains. But also, as a teen, especially towards the end, we noticed that, you know, due to his talent in sword fighting, everyone was really starting to talk Elma up. His mother was starting to say that, you know, Elma is the the best alpha candidate. He is totally made to be the next alpha and basically no matter how I feel like honorable you start off, when people start putting you on a pedestal and constantly drilling into you that, you know, you are the best, you are the best, you are so talented, you are so talented, I think that has made Elma as a young adult a bit more lax and, you know, it's, it's as though he's now relying on all the talent he displayed in his teen years and he has reached a point where he feels as though he doesn't need to try as much as he used to before because I mean he's clearly proven himself everyone feels like he's going to be the next alpha or he should be the next alpha so why would he put extra effort in I think it's laziness that has seeped in because of the way people treat him so there we go that is young adult Elma We are picking up on Sunday morning back at the castle and we have quite a few notes to go through before we start wrapping up. So 
first up, we're gonna we're gonna get Eugene over here to chat with Will. Now, Will, I feel has been a little bit absent from things, from from the story, uh, our shepherd, because everyone's been focused on you know other aspects of the family. But let's go and have a chat with Will. Um, let's see. Uh, we could share werewolf experiences, but I kind of want to not taste in music, uh, hobbies, maybe hobbies and skills. We're gonna we're gonna chat with him if possible about hobbies and skills. Oh geez, where'd he go? Where'd he go? You need to get out of the pool, my dude. You need to get out of the pool. Come on, can we get out of the pool? Can we can we come up here and chat with Will the way you want to? Eugene? Thank you. Okay. Eugene's on his way to do what we want him to do. But guys, Eugene wants to chat with Will and reconnect with the shepherd. He received a lot of guidance from him when he was young and he feels like now is a good time for him to revisit some of the more intellectual learnings of his youth because th uh, the kennel master you know, the person who has largely been in charge of the boys' education ever since they moved into the royal grounds, she's focused on the physical nature of things. I mean, that's what the kennel master is all about. Obviously, the well-being of our wolves, but mainly, you know, their strength and strength training. Whereas, we know that Eugene, he's a genius, he leans more towards intellectual things, and when he's thinking about the various mentors at his disposal, really the shepherd is the only one who, you know, started off teaching the kids their histories, their um, basic skills, um, and oh, oh, okay, who's, is it Jim? Is it Jim and Will at it again? Um, I don't know how often these two fight, but that's interesting, and Jim is Eugene's father, so he's probably um, watching this with extreme interest. But yes, you know, basically, Will is the one who started off with, you know, logical pursuits, philosophy, all of these things that Eugene really took an interest in. Um, the shepherd was the only one setting a foundation for the kids, and then when they moved on to the castle, they kind of left that behind and started focusing more on the physical nature of stuff. So he wants to reconnect with Will and um, learn more about, about that. So there we go. That's something we had there. Uh, the next next one up, for once, Hobby didn't have stuff for us, didn't have notes for us. But Elma, he also wants to stargaze with Will. It is very early now, so I don't know if even they'll be able to get that done. Uh, nope. So it is too early, but I will get him to come up here if possible and just socialize. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll crack a joke. Do you want to crack a joke with Will? Yeah, we'll just crack a joke with Will. Um, but... He wants to stargaze with Will and talk about how far he has come since his childhood days. He's thinking about the past and is curious about how he was as a baby and toddler because that is not something he experienced in this dimension. So we have to remember that Elma, he switched dimension. He was torn from his own, you know, birth family and parents and brought here by by Earl accidentally, but that happened to him when he was a child. So the basically the early years that he remembers is with a different Will, is with a different shepherd. It was still Uncle Will, but the way he looked was different and the memories he has with him is different. Um, and he's never really, I suppose he, well now he feels close to Will, you know, he, he found that connection with a lot of the family members in this dimension eventually, but he doesn't have any of those memories of Will that the other kids do. But obviously nobody knows this. So as someone who is approaching the the time where he may potentially become Alpha, he's more curious about the original Elma. He's curious about the Elma of this dimension and how he was when he was young. Um, he, he hasn't really thought much about it beforehand. He spent a lot of his younger days trying to, you know, emulate the Elma or be the Elma he thought he was supposed to be. And then in his teenage years, he was starting to feel comfortable in his skin and he was starting to 
really kind of hone in on his talents, but now as a young adult, he, in terms of the physicality of things, is becoming a little bit lazy and kind of riding on his reputation at this point. Um, but as such, now he has time to think. And with the time he has to think, because, you know, he's being idle and not doing much, he's thinking, I wonder how the the original Elma of this place was. What kind of, what kind of, um, like, infanthood or infancy did he have he's curious about that so that's what he wanted to do there uh, the next note we have with ada blade so ada wants to stargaze with ralph obviously that's not something you can do i'm gonna wake up real quick okay i'm sorry but yeah okay i un undid that that's fine um but we are gonna find ralph oh ralph's right here we're chasing him we're chasing ralph ralph um can we just Real quick, discuss horse riding, why not? Oh my goodness, is she ill? <gasps> Ada's ill, guys! She's been taken by a sickness. Okay, let's hope she doesn't die of hysteria. Let us hope. She should be fine, I think. I'm praying, she should be fine. Um, but yes, everyone be careful. She is... She's, she's sick right now. She has a sickness. Okay, let's... Come on, let's chat about what I wanted to chat about. I guess even horse riding isn't that. Gossip about family drama. You know what? Yes, that is do the drama thing. Talk about family drama. So Ada wants to start gaze with Ralph and ask him how he's doing. She saw the fight between him and Helen and feels terrible about it. Ada knows how the loss of a faded mate feels and that it'll be hard for Ralph to see her without having that connection. And of course, Helen decides to crash this moment and then promptly walk out because she cannot stand Ralph. But I, I find this a very funny concern of hers to have because she's the whole reason they failed. She's the whole reason why they could not work out with each other. You know, if she hadn't gone for Helen and started making moves on Helen, then none of this, and I'm pretty sure she did this at the observatory, none of this would have happened. I remember that. I remember that chapter. None of this would have happened if Ada had kept to herself. They were doing just about fine. They had little fights, but they were doing fine for the most part before Ada came along and ruined everything because she started seeing her dead mate in Helen. Anyways, that's another story. She, you know, on, on the flip side of the coin, she knows how it felt when Catherine was killed and Catherine died and she lost that connection with her and she knows she'll never be able to have that with anyone. And at this point, Helen has declared Ralph her enemy. She's sympathizing with Ralph and, you know, she, she can understand the pain he must be going through not only being in disagreement with your fated mate permanently, but knowing that there is no one else out there for you that is going to feel the same as your fated mate did. And you, you'll be able to see her, but she's going to be with other people. And by other people, I mean with Ada. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez, like pouring salt on someone's wound. But yeah, the fact that Helen's going to be with Ada. She remembers how it felt when Catherine was with with Julia, so you know, it's it's not a happy times, and she she just wanted to talk with him a little bit. He's angry, but she wanted to comfort him. Which some of these Sims, I swear, the things they do, I can't I can't tell whether I should hate them for it or I should, you know, I I, sh I should feel like it's sweet of them to be doing this because really she's comforting Ralph, but she's the whole reason he's in this mess. Anyways, um, moving on from this, we have some notes with Julia. So Julia here wants to make out with Ada, so I'm actually going to get her to sit here. I'm going to get Ada to come here. You guys, let's excuse yourselves a little bit. Come on, Ada. Wrap up the conversation. I don't know how... Uh, I, I don't know if she should be doing this because Ada is sick. The Alpha might get sick too. But she doesn't care. Um, why would she care about such things? Okay, we're gonna do the makeout. So basically, Julia wants to make out with Ada and celebrate her eldest surviving son's birthday with some intimacy. She's been feeling a little neglected by her wife and wants to demand her attention as the alpha. She's childish. She's gonna do stuff like that. I feel like as much as... Ju oh, oh, all it took was a kiss and her sickness is gone. <laughs> Oh wow, the alpha's got magical powers of romance. Would you look at that? Okay, 
Well, that was kind of surprising. Anyways, Julia, even though she tries, especially as an adult, to, you know, be deep and meaningful and sincere and genuine about certain things, she can't help but revert to a childish nature. And when she's not getting the reciprocation from Ada, then she starts demanding that, you know, she is Ada's alpha and Ada should give her attention when she wants it and she is Ada's wife and she should get affection from Ada when she wants it. She starts demanding it and I feel like that kind of, it, I don't know if it throws Ada back into a state of, you know, just neutralness, not feeling anything, or if it kind of validates the way Ada feels about this whole relationship that really there's nothing meaningful here. She's just going through the motions of doing what she is expected to do. So that aside, Julia also wants to get to know Prince Will. Oh, 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 I think Will was upstairs. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. I see you. I see you, bud. Okay, get to know. You haven't chatted with your brother in a long time. I'm, I'm glad to know your relationship is still good, though. They had a really awkward phase at one point where there was like some, there was an inkling of romance and I was like, what? Incest? Why? But, um, yeah, nothing's, I think it was at their wedding. He's laughed her at the wedding. But ever since then, it's been like hush, hush, taboo. Nobody's spoken about it. They've kind of brushed it under the rug, pretended like it never happened. Um, but you know, their friendship's going fine. Okay, let's get to know. Let's get to know. Come on. Okay, so Julia also wants to get to know how Will's been doing at the Royal Den without children to look after and discuss how he feels about one of the sons potentially inheriting his role. So traditionally a girl would, but Julia wants to make changes to certain aspects of their court. So I know in the beginning we said that boys would inherit the ladies' roles and that uh, a girl would inherit the shepherd's role. But... Uh, I mean, it doesn't matter that we don't have Lillian. Like, if I wanted to, I could just, um, like, make a new sim in the next generation to be the shepherd, a female sim. But I think my headspace at the beginning of this generation was more that I kind of wanted to stick with three females so that we could develop our story easier. I didn't want to have too many characters introduced at the same time because... Uh, personally, I mean, with when I think back to, because I've done the Amazon challenge in many variations at this point, and I feel like when I did Vampire Amazon, we started off with one sim, literally, and then I slowly added other sims in, and I was able to incorporate stories in, but I've also started Amazon challenges where I have a ton of characters. Like, I have, you know, five or six, like, I have the, the whole cast. But because I introduce all of these strangers in one go, it's harder to develop stories for them and harder for me to crystallize them as individual characters. Um, and they end up becoming just sims that I'm going through the motion of because I haven't formed any attachment to them. So I think I wanted for, for the werewolves to start off with a very small number of sims, especially uh, like ladies because that was going to be our main focus for this generation. Start with a small number of sims and ladies, um, and that way I could develop their characters and become attached to them. And obviously we ended up having a ton of deaths and then ladies coming in, but each time we were able to build a little bit of a story for them and then develop some sort of connection with them, which I'm happy we did it that way because now we're in this situation where I don't feel as though we have really blank characters or we don't have really cookie cutter characters. So I'm happy about that. Um, and so now I'm thinking that I would, because we have six sons and we only have four roles, right? If you include the shepherd, there's only four roles, but we have six sons. So I, I, I think I would like the idea of our sons or as many as possible inheriting those roles um, and then you know the the excess sons we have so basically the sons that uh, what I might end up doing is have 
all the like we have sons for the four roles including the shepherd and then we'll just make it so that generation three obviously we'll have all ladies and then generation four we'll have all boys again so we won't like the essentially we'll be operating with lords and ladies we won't have a mixed or like slash princes like something like that but we won't be operating with you know a certain ratio of males and then females we'll have all males or all females in leadership roles is essentially what i'm trying to say so i think that's what i want to do and that's what i'm probably going to do and i didn't i think as well the thing i was worried about before because we were introducing new characters and i knew eventually the shepherd would have to move out i didn't want to have a female sim that we barely spent time with and barely developed as a as a story and then we sent her out and then we'd barely see her and then we wouldn't have any feelings towards her she'd just be another number um, I didn't want that, which is why I made it a male. But all of the males, like all of the sons we currently have, we've had them since they were babies and we've developed their stories, we've played them. So even if they were to move out of the castle, like if one of them were to, which to be fair, in the next generation, two of them, no, three of them are going to be moving out. Because, you know, if someone takes on the shepherd role, the two spares are going to also have to take on other roles in the kingdom. Because we only have the three... Um, lords slash ladies in the castle and then their kids plus the horses so even if one of the sons ends up moving out I won't feel bad because we spent a, like an entire season developing their story so we'll still feel attached to them so that was kind of my reasoning for why I did certain things the way that I did and I hope everyone's okay with that I mean in your own games if you want to continue with the whole you know uh having the shepherd be the opposite gender of Ariel, like the alpha, then that's fine. But for me, I think I think I want to change the way I'm doing it. And that's going to make me happier. That's going to, I would rather, at this point, like I would rather have um, someone that we have an attachment to and we've developed stories with in the role of a shepherd than a new sim that I bring in who we don't know anything about. I think that's where my preference currently lies and thinking about the roles as well from here um, basically where my head is at where my head is at we might make it so that we have so obviously one son is going to be the alpha one son is going to end up being and by son i mean like out of the six um, so one of the boys are going to be the alpha, one of the boys are going to take on role of kennel master, one of the boys are going to be matchmaker, one of the boys are going to be shepherd, and then we have two boys remaining. And I'm thinking we'll make those boys, I'm still a little bit unsure about this, but we'll either make both the boys educators in the like for the royal army or we'll end up making both the boys captains so they'll both have the role of captains and they'll be in charge of any of the girls that are born and you know training them to be in the royal guard so i think that's the way we might do things and you know in the future like if we have match suitors and stuff we might have each of the captains with their own group of like seven troops or something like that i'll have to figure it out but i might make the excess sons captains so that's kind of where i'm at with um planning for the future and what i'm thinking about but okay guys with that said and done i am going to leave off thank you so much for watching i hope you all enjoyed when we come back next time we are going to be having the birthday of ed into a teen so that is going to be very very exciting for us and then obviously we are going to be having the the training for him to see how he goes with that and okay guys i will see you all in the next video bye bye